Hebrews. Right before Rachel filed for the divorce, Rachel was offered to be a partner of her husband, Charles Capone, in his shop, in his motor shop, because she was helping a lot and it needed a woman's charge and she was really doing a lot of work in the shop, especially the paperwork and such things. So she took on a, she took on the offer from her husband Capone and she started working there so although she asked for the divorce and separation she would still continue working there Rachel started getting weird text messages she started getting private calls she was being harassed over the phone she was like in a situation where she had a stalker, but she did not know who who would do these things to her. She did not have any enemies, and she was really surprised. Why would somebody be stalking her? She contacted Charles Capone, her ex-husband, who's a partner in the workshop, and she said that I'm, being, I'm getting these harassing messages and all. But Rachel had this man who lived down the street where she lives, whose name was William. And William asked Rachel plenty of times if she'd like to go for on a date with him and she used to always refuse. So he was kind of like a stalker in the neighborhood for Rachel. So she started wondering if it could be William. She was kind of convinced it was him. Later on, Charles would tell Rachel that he was getting stalking. He was being stalked too. He was being harassed over the phone. They were playing different voices over the phone. They were playing different recordings over the phone. He felt threatened. He was being threatened. And he said it seemed to be the similar pattern that Rachel was going through. So Rachel started wondering, do we have enemies in common? what is actually going on but she was kind of convinced that it was William the neighbor was doing this she did not think much about it another time somebody knocked at her door and immediately left it was raining outside she just opened the door and she checked there was a male cologne a perfume lying on a pot so she did not know if this was a joke, if this was serious, and what was going on. Luckily, Rachel told her family about it, and her neighbors and all. She was asking them if, it, if they knew who was doing this. Then she decided to contact Ida Moscow. She decided to contact the police station to report this, and... The officer that she got in touch with was from Idaho, Moscow. So she told him what she was going through, that she was being harassed and such things. And he said he would look into it. And he, he was satisfied that she was writing and reporting things and keeping on to evidence and he encouraged her to continue doing that. While this was going on, Rachel decided on the 9th of April 2010 she decided to go to Capone's shop Charles Capone that she was separated from her ex-husband and she decided that she'd have a couple of beers with him and try and convince him to sign the papers quicker because he seemed to have been taking his own cool time to be signing these papers. Now, Charles Capone was living with a friend and the friend's wife, whose name was Bet. So she went down to the shop. Rachel went down, she spoke to Capone. And before she spoke to him, she came out of the car and she was like kind of yelling at him. It will be later said and I'll explain it on the line so that was the last time Rachel Anderson was seen 
moving on 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 the day following this is a Friday Saturday she, this, uh, Rachel was supposed to come to work the work did, didn't know where she was she did not call and that was out of her behavior and character so the work let it go because it was a one-time thing and it was a Saturday so they didn't think much about it on Sunday there was nobody heard of Rachel so people assumed maybe that she was just resting it wasn't out of the ordinary and the work did not inform anyone because they didn't think much about it they didn't think much about it so they let it go on Monday Rachel did not attend work so the family so the work got concerned they called they tried to contact her, reach her, there was nothing. The family started getting uh, Rachel's daughters. Amber was the oldest, started getting concerned. There was wondering, and Adrian, I believe, they started wondering where was their mother. They started contacting everyone, contacting all their friends, contacting their aunts. The mother had two sisters, Christy and another sister. But they didn't hear anything of their mother, Rachel Anderson. So they reported it to the police. Luckily, the case was given to the same officer. I believe his name was David. David was the man who had the case of the harassments and stalking behaviors that Rachel Anderson was witnessing. So remember he told her to keep all the reports and hand in everything to him. So he started wondering now this is getting weird because Rachel complained to him that she was having harassment and stalking issues. And then he, rem he checked his notes and he remembered that Charles Capone, the husband, was getting the same threatening and harassing messages too. So he was wondering and phone calls. So he's wondering if they, the couple had enemies if they pissed off anyone on the way, what could be the problem? And then he decided, David, the detective, decided to talk to Amber, the oldest daughter of Rachel. This is Rachel Anderson and her husband, Charles Capone. Not Al Capone, but Charles Capone. This is Rachel Anderson. And these are Rachel's two beautiful daughters, Amber and Adriana Blair. That's Rachel. They look so beautiful. They all look like each other, actually. May God bless her soul. These were the daughters that got worried when the mother did not turn up to work. The detective went down questioning neighbors, the community, and he started trying to ping down and locate Rachel Anderson's phone. When he pinged it, it pinged at this area in Idaho, Moscow, a really isolated area. So he and Rachel's daughters and the community and other officers became boots on the ground. They lined up and they checked. They went in lines trying to locate Rachel is phone device but the battery was maybe going off so that it stopped pinging after a while they spent many hours on this field with no luck here's the officers searching for the phone but they started getting more concerned why would the phone ping in an area 
that is so isolated, just like the area, the police, the Moscow Idol was saying that Brian Christopher Kohlberger drove towards Clarkson, and that's where actually Rachel is from. That's quite interesting. Amber and Ashley, I'm really, I apologize, it was in Adriana, it was Ashley, started getting concerned and worried. They started making missing flyers for their mother, for the neighborhood, to drive around and check if they see anything odd. And if they see Rachel Anderson, to call in the police line because it was getting into a serious concern. Days passed and there was no news of Rachel Anderson. Police decided to interview Charles Capone. He said that he hasn't seen Rachel Anderson, his wife, that he was going to a separation with. He said that she came to his workshop that's in Idaho, Moscow, to return the car that she borrowed from him because somebody slashed her tires while she and her sons were sleeping. Remember I told her that she was getting harassing phone calls and Mr. Charles Capone told his ex-wife Rachel that he was getting the same harassment calls too. So the detective started asking Charles questions and he kept on answering that he had, he saw her last when she came to his workshop to return the car. He said that she took his visa card or credit card and she was going to do some shopping. Rachel was known to use a credit card very often to do shopping. She, she used to love doing her shopping and she used to earn her money well as a medical technician. But Capone said that he and his wife had the relationship of sharing their credit cards. The detective went back to check if Capone's credit cards was used and it was just like he said, Rachel just went and bought some things from the supermarket and that was the loss of her. The police checked the areas around the Walmarts and they found Rachel's car parked in one of the parking places. They started checking it, doing forensic searches. The car seemed to be very clean and that was very out of character for Rachel according to her daughters because that just shows us how our behaviors and our patterns helps to solve crimes. They knew that Rachel wouldn't leave a car clean and they checked and it did not match up with their behavior. The police decided to check Charles Capone's workshop and they found two guns there, two rifles. They arrested him for that because allegedly, actually not allegedly, this man was under parole and he was not supposed to be near firearms. And he was. The sad thing is Rachel did not know he was a convicted felon. So he had the firearms in his workshop. The police took that. They took him to court and they arrested him for two years. Now police is left to do the detective work of where and how Rachel turned up missing. The last person to see her was her husband, Charles Capone. So the police was at his police multiple service workshop. They, saw, they got a warrant to check his 
workshop. They didn't find much, but they checked and found the weapons, got him arrested, got him done for that for at least two years, while the detective was still continuing doing the job. But the police did not leave without asking him for a sample of his DNA. So they took his DNA and they was doing their further investigation in trying to find Rachel Anderson. Now police was left with this difficult job of finding out what exactly happened to Rachel Anderson. Like I said, Charles Capone was arrested for the charges of the firearms since he was in pro, uh, provision, uh, pro, probation he had no right to be having any firearms in his house or in his firework in his workshop motor workshop police started going down the list of this man Charles Capone his phones to try and see who he's been contacting so that they could contact them and interview them and ask them questions about this man's whereabouts since he is not talking much about what where he's been and what he's been up to. Police found an interesting person called Tim. Tim and Tim spoke to the police. He had an interesting conversation with the police actually. And he told Tim told the police that what a what happened one night when he and Charles were sitting and chilling and drinking and talking and Charles told him about an incident that happened two nights before that where he got physical with Rachel Anderson and he really beat her badly may she rest in peace he told him about incidents that has happened in his house and how he would get physical with her at times and that it could get brutal because he would get really upset with her, according to Charles. The detective spoke to Amber, uh, who's the oldest daughter actually, of Rachel Anderson, and she told the detectives that she's always had just a bad vibe being around her stepfather, and that would be Capone. She said he just gave her bad vibes and that she's never felt happy around him. What was interesting and surprising is while all the community, Rachel's daughters, all the people that know Rachel was putting in hard work, searching for her everywhere, Capone did not even turn up to search for his ex-wife, his wife, or because they're going through a separation did not bother and that obviously raises red flags because if you have nothing to hide and if you really care for the human being because there was still although they were going to a separation he said that he had hoped to mend this relationship so if you have hope you would be the first one in line searching for Rachel but that did not happen with this man who was always a narcissistic and was a very selfish character he continued lying and being deceive, deceitful. What basically happened before he was arrested is Jim Burt actually told on him. He told more, more, more about Capone. So he said that the night Rachel was missing, it was a Friday around 7 p.m., he said he remembered that Capone was staying with actually Tim Burt and Tim Burt's wife, Bet, uh, Bert, or uh, Betty, Bet, sorry. So he said that while he was living with the couple, the wife said she, she noticed that he was having insomnia and sleeping problems and all issues, so she gave him two of a strong medicine that was prescribed to her which really knocks out people and puts people to sleep. It's not supposed to be taken with alcohol. What was interesting is Tim said that he 
the Charles Capone did not have any empathy of searching for Rachel and that he actually even made jokes saying that she came to my garage like while she, we are sitting and drinking after she got the drinks I put in a couple of those, med, uh, those sleeping pills into Rachel's drink to knock her off before he did whatever he didn't explain the rest so Tim said that he just got a bad vibe he said he, uh, that Charles Capone came back home because he was living he was staying with him he came back home early in the morning he did not look right he seemed to be really exhausted and tired and he just went to the room and passed out the wife says that she tried to wake him up she saw that he was sleeping so she did not bother because she had food for him she said she just put it in the oven she said he did not get up right up to the next day the following day so this man must have been really exhausted and this was the same day that Rachel Anderson would be missing unfortunately this case continues because Charles Capone is in jail now there's a young boy who lives near the shop near the police shop that is four minutes away from 1122 Kings Road the Ida Moscow case and that young teenager boy was apparently playing football or some kind of ball at his mother's yard and while he was playing outside he could hear a car come in to the police multiple services and then he hears a woman come out of the car and she seems to be really fuming angry the woman parks her car just right in front of the uh, police services and then she, a man comes out that is actually Charles Capone and they get into a heated argument he's not saying much she is fuming and she's yelling at him and he comes out and he, and she's continuing yelling and he goes back and then she goes after him but she never goes inside the garage and then he finally comes out yelling at her too yelling back and then she goes after him inside the boy the teenager continues playing with the with his dog and the ball so he doesn't even think much about it he comes closer to the police multiple service but he seems to go quiet so he doesn't think much about it then he, he goes back and he hears them yelling again and then all of a sudden he hears a thud and he goes near the shop and everything is quiet he didn't think much about it he went back home but he told the detective that so obviously the detective is comparing what Tim told him and how Tim's wife told him about the sleeping pills the detective went back to Tim's wife and he asked her how many sleeping pills did you give him she said I just gave him two so he said where's your sleeping pills she went to the medicine cabinet she checked and a lot of the pills were missing so the detective understood because her husband Tim said that he passed his joke that he would put a lot of pills into Rachel's drinks to get her to be completely knocked out unfortunately so while this man Capone was arrested and he was doing time for two years in jail he started talking to the inner mates, mates explaining what he did and he had this nasty habit of saying that he would get rid of Rachel he said that to the prison mates and throw her body in the Snake River which wasn't far from where Rachel lived it was really sad the police started getting more and more information from the prison mates and then the young boy the teenager who was playing outside remembered that there was another man he said when he went after he heard the thud and he went near the shop he couldn't see anyone but he could hear two men talking so he knew there was another man there 
the police continued doing their work and the research, they found out that that man, his name is David Stone. So the police started, the detective started going to David Stone and checking on his alibi. David Stone was lying at the start. Then the police knew that now they don't have a body, they don't have the weapon, but they have kind of a motive. The motive is this man, Charles Capone, does not want to go let go of his wife, Rachel Anderson, because we can clearly see the red flags that he was stalking her, and he was stalking himself, it sounds funny to say, pretending that he was being harassed and stalk, stalked while he was doing the stalking. So this was really messy. The police decided to have interviews with David Stone. They even spoke to his wife. They found out that he wasn't at home on Friday evening at the certain period. That was the period that Rachel Anderson was last seen in the police multiple services and she was with Charles Capone because she, remember she took the credit card and she went and did a bit shopping. She went and she got some beers and she did some other shopping. So that showed on Mr. Capone is bank statements. The case went cold for a while, for a couple of months, while this man was in prison. The next year, he started talking to prison mates, explaining what he would do and how he did it. Then the police knew that they didn't have a body, they didn't have a, a weapon, so they decided that sometimes you have to make a deal with the devil. That's very unfortunate. So the police decided, since David Stone was, they believed, there that night, they made a deal with David Stone that they would let him go if he gives up Charles Capone and says what happened, which he did. They both were taken to court. He told the police, the detectives at once, that he came there, he was in the workshop, and he said that Rachel came and Rachel was having this fit and she was yelling and screaming and all outside the workshop. So that makes sense to what the young boy said. And he said that all of a sudden he said, I came out and I saw him, that's Charles Capone, dragging, pulling Rachel inside and he started he put on the floor, that's where the thud came from. When he dropped on the floor, he started trigger warning, strangling her. And he said he saw, he, he could literally see the life being sucked out of this poor woman, Rachel Anderson. This is really shocking. And he didn't stop it. So when the officer, detective asked him, why didn't you stop it? He said, no, because I was scared of his rage and his anger that he would kill me too, because I'm the only witness. So the police offered his statements, his witness statements, if if he turns against Capone, that they would let him go free. The court case, the court case started, and so this is the statement David uh, Stone actually gave the police. He said, number one, Alicia, that's a... Uh, David's wife stated David left to go to Capone's shop around 1.30 p.m. or 2 p.m. David said he went to Capone's shop around 4 or 4.30. 4 Alisa said David called her from the shop around 3 p.m. So Alisa is David's wife. That is the guy who is going to turn on Capone, his best friend. So he called at 3 p.m. from his shop and he told her they hadn't been able to work on her car yet. So Elisa was expecting David to work on her car, which he's been promising to do for a long time and he hasn't done. Number two, this is what David's saying. Phone records show David called Capone's shop several times during the time that David claimed to be at the shop. 
Now pay attention. David called Capone's shop several times during the time that David claimed to be at the shop. Why would he be calling someone's shop when he's already at the shop? David explained this by saying Capone was wearing an earpiece while he, wor he worked on the car and David was calling him just to mess with him. Grown men in the 40s saying that they're messing with each other by calling each other. Obviously, they're trying. He's trying to get a timeline and evidence that he was actually there. Number three, David said he went to A&W around 7 p.m. and also went to the store side of the business to buy candy. David says he went into the front doors when told he does not show up on the video. He said that maybe he didn't go into the front doors and maybe he didn't buy candy. So you can clearly see he's lying. This is at 7 p.m. when the detective is trying to line up and find out what, what exactly happened to missing 39-year-old, 40-year-old uh, Rachel Anderson. So he's, uh, David is trying to make an alibi saying at 7 p.m. that he went to buy candy. And then the of detective, the officer says, yeah, but I checked the front cameras of the candy shop and you didn't come up in it. He said, yeah, because that's because I may have not gone to the front. And then he said, oh, maybe I didn't even buy candy. So he's trying to play with the police, obviously. Number four, David and Rachel and the Yukon, Yukon were gone when he got back from getting food shortly after 7 p.m. The Yukon was gone too. I think that's the car that uh, Rachel, the white car that Rachel Ballwood, because you'll remember her car tires were slashed and then Capone lent her a car from his shop. You can clearly see the manipulation that he's doing. He is acting like he is a provider by providing a car while he went and he slashed her own car tires. Imagine that. Like basically he wants her to be dependent and needy towards him so that she wouldn't basically leave him. Although she left him physically and asked him to move out, he still wanted to be in her life and he didn't want to sign he didn't want to sign the divorce papers. Now we know that he is a convicted felon and he's done crimes before like being caught with firearms he was under uh, probation and he got caught with firearms again. So this man is a deadly, dangerous, fate a man that can do serious harm to people. But poor Rachel did not know about it. So David, his timeline, he's trying to say went to bought candy. So the Yukon, that uh, the white Yukon that Charles Capone lent his wife that is under separation with Rachel before she went missing. She was driving that car because he slashed her, her car tires and he pretended that he and her were vic victims of somebody anonymous who was harassing them while it was him who was doing all the work, all the bad things so that she could come and turn and ask for help. So basically David drove the white Yukon to the parking place in, in one of the shopping car place, shopping mall car park or a Walmart car park. Rachel's car was found there. The white Yukon she was driving, her purse was found in it with keys, makeup, her credit cards, her debit cards, everything was there. What was funny is the purse was open. It was just lying there for anyone to see. it. So it was made to look like it was a robbery. And she was still missing. This is now on the 16th of April. Basically, you can see I'm going. I told you the story of exactly what happened. And now that we know that David Stone is working with the police and giving the statements and the full details and reports while 
Charles is in, in is arrested for breaking his breaching his probation by carrying fi having firearms again. So now we're talking about David. David drove the white Yukon that Rachel borrowed from her husband. So this is after they unlived her. David Stone drove it. David Stone, now Shocks is his name, now named David O'Reilly, delivered a part of the Durango, but it was the wrong part. When told the parts delivered were for Rachel's car, David said he didn't know where Capone got the part for his car. Maybe it, did, it had been on the counter, but it was on the wrong part. So basically, let's, let's not forget, Rachel came there because to fix her car and she was going to give the Yukon back and her car was going to be fixed, that her tires was slashed. And now don't forget, David's son is here too because his wife, Alicia, is expecting him to fix her car. And while he was fixing her, while he, he said he went to the shop to fix his wife Elisa's car, he found out that he had to order a new motor. So now there's a motor waiting here, a part of the car waiting here for Rachel's car. But David is saying it's his. When, okay, David said he dropped Capone off at a mingle, at Mingles around 9.30 p.m. That is what David is saying. And picked him up around 10 p.m. So within half an hour, he picked him up from the Mingles. David picked up Charles Capone. Let's not forget that. David said he dropped Capone off at Mingles around 9.30 p.m. And he picked him, he picked him up around 10 p.m. When told that Capone never enters Mingles, David said he just dropped Capone off but didn't say where he went to. These two men, David and Charles, are playing games. When David is told that there's no phone record of the call, David said that maybe Charles was standing outside and waiting for him. So you can see they're clearly lying about each and everything. The police started questioning David Moore about that night and David said that like I told you when Elisa's car park came car parts came his wife it it did not belong to the car so he had to reorder and wait another hour and a half for the car parts to arrive. He was supposed to wait an hour it turned an hour and a half. So now clearly on the police and detectives list David Stone and Charles Capone are involved in the murder of Rachel Anderson. It's no longer a missing case. They understood that this woman was murdered because David Stone told on Charles Capone how he suffocated her in the shop and he was told to drive a white Yukon to the parking place where Rachel's car was found. These two became the murder suspects, according to Moscow police and the detectives. That's David Stone on the left, Charles Capone on the right. You can see Charles Capone changed a lot in jail. In jail. He turned much thinner. He has glasses on now. You can see from both of their eyes, they don't have empathy. I believe Charles Capone has antisocial personality disorder. I believe he's a psychopath, to be honest. He has no remorse. He has no accountability. He's laughing about what he did to Rachel in jail. And luckily, David Stone is a witness to what happened. But there's still no body, still no motive. They have the motive, but they don't have the murder weapon, and they don't have the body. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. I really love this part and I really appreciated it because I wanted justice for not only Rachel Anderson, for all the victims, especially women who live under domestic violence, who are abused daily, who don't have a way to figure out what to do. And even if they try to leave, 
a cup a percent of the women in domestic violence do not survive the worst time to leave is when you're breaking up with your partner whether you're a woman or man if you feel vulnerable the best thing is if you think your partner is a narcissistic or has example firearms in the house whether he has a license or not if he know, obviously you would know his behavior his life pattern you know what triggers him and if he's a jealous partner obsessed with you do what is right and don't tell your partner anything do not say you're leaving especially when children are involved because your partner wants his children to be around and he loves the fact that he has everything in check that he's controlling you abusing you whether it's physically whether it's mentally or whether it's emotionally so always look out for those signs and never sit and think that a person is going to get better i would say that as a licensed mental health counselor because things never get better a person can never change their character and their behavior so quickly they can change certain things but certain things are out of their hands a very good example is like antisocial personality disorder it's known that it's genetic some things of their behavior they can absolutely not control and the way they think they have lack of empathy lack of remorse they never take accountability they never go to therapy because they believe they are right and i'm not saying anything negative about somebody who suffers of antisocial personality disorder aka psychopath like they say not all psychopaths are serial killers or murderers there are many people who live as psychopaths normally but there are many psychopaths who could be sitting in big ceo companies because they don't they really don't care about firing or hiring people they don't care how it affects your family or lifestyle if you lose your job very sad but that is sometimes psychopaths cannot control certain parts they don't have the part in their brain that the sensitive part that deals synthetic part that deals with things like empathy emotions even watching a animal bleed or person or getting hurt a psychopath may just help you for the sake of helping or for the sake of his benefits or her benefits they usually don't do it out to the heart because they don't have that process where empathy emotions and such things work that's why it's easy for them to be in jobs where they have to fire people they're always money motivated and they will be in a place where they get benefits for themselves a psychopath antisocial personality person really has narcissistic behaviors narcissistic traits they love to manipulate people love to bully people love to they always end up in criminal acts usually and the reason that i'm talking about antisocial personality disorder now is because this is a good chance to talk about them charles capone seems to have the typical behaviors and characters of a antisocial personality disorder which is really scary typical things are criminal history he's a, he seems to be a criminal always he's been caught for firearms and he still is doing the same thing so that shows lack of remorse lack of empathy no accountability he's still doing it again then you have him calling poor rachel harassing her over the phone stalking behavior acting like a normal person when it is him then he's calling himself acting like he's a victim look at all that that's a typical psychopath behavior they're very good in acting very good in deceiving very intelligent people i'm not saying all psychopaths sorry not all antisocial personality disorder people are like that but they do have that lack of empathy so they won't they don't care who they hurt some of them could do it just so fun like just for 
whatever pleasure they get out of it some of them are serial killers but they're very few statistically serial killers most of them I'm talking about antisocial personality disorder try to work hard and earn their money and all but if they just heal like something is not right in their life when they get upset and it triggers them it could end up deadly I'm not saying all of them but many of them like in this case of Charles Capone now what is finally interesting is Charles Capone has spoken now to many of the inmates, inmates and admitted what he would have done to his wife Rachel Anderson that he would throw a killer and throw in the Snake River. David Stone, his friend, confessed everything to the police. He told them exactly what he did. Charles Capone even confessed to his preacher about his feelings and about his rage and anger towards Rachel. But then in the court of law, the priest is not allowed to talk or tell on you, basically. But this man already told plenty on himself in prison, in jail, and he told on himself to, uh, to David Stone, to his friend Tim, Tim's wife Beth, saw how exhausted, or exhausted he was, he didn't sleep for two days. Finally, the detective built the case after two years almost. He took the case to the prosecutor and he said, do you think we can try this case because we don't have Rachel's body? And we have Capone arrested for firearms and breaching his prosecution, uh, uh, breaching his parole. So should we, we prosecuted him for that for two years, but we can't do more. And, and the detective promised to get justice for this woman. He was contacting the daughters regularly. He was trying to still investigate it hard. Then luckily the prosecutor, this is the good part, said, bring it on, we'll prosecute the case without a body. Now you know how difficult it is to prosecute a case without a body. But that prosecutor took the chance. And that was actually kind of concerning for people because once you lose, you can't prosecute the person again. In prison, the confession he made was Charles, Compo Charles Capone said, told inmate, he put on a top, cut up body, dissolving car parts, washer these are all the things he admitted that he did to poor 40 year old rachel anderson this was the cell phone stone cell phone and rachel and capone there's no phone activity at that day now the prosecutor said he's going to take the case to court and try and try do a trial to get Charles Capone to pay for the murder of his missing wife, Rachel Anderson. This is where it gets interesting, and that is why I chose this case for my viewers and subscribers. The prosecutor ended up being the prosecutor that said he's going to prosecute and uh, Charles Capone and take him to court for murdering Rachel Anderson without he didn't have a body 